the Second World War. Sometimes it feels like we must have heard about every heroic deed, every tragic defeat, every hard-won battle on the Western Front. But this was a global war. And as it turns out, some of the strangest and most overlooked moments happened in Canada. Like the tiny invasion of Newfoundland, the Germans launched to set up a weather station, which no one even found until 1977, where the 17 U-boats that prowled the waters of the St. Lawrence, or the Japanese bombs floating on weather balloons that fell on the prairies. Or here, in unassuming Bowmanville, the site of the only clash between Axis and Allied powers to take place in rural Ontario. This is Canadiana. It's 1940, and things are not going very well for Britain. London is being devastated by German bombs. It seems entirely possible that England could be invaded and occupied. And that wouldn't just mean lost territory. Thousands of German infantry and officers are being held prisoner here. Occupation would mean all those soldiers back on the field. And worse, a contingent of high-ranking officers able to command again. So the Allies decide to put an ocean in the way. It will be a year before the United States joins the war. So it falls on Canada to scramble together 26 POW camps, including one here, just outside Bowmanville, Ontario. It used to be a boys' reform school, but in 1941, it was frantically refitted into Camp 30, just in time for the first prisoners to arrive. Its past life as a school gave it some decidedly unprison-like amenities. In fact, life for German POWs in Canada was quite a bit more comfortable than you might expect. They had an indoor pool, full athletic facilities, including a basketball and tennis court that was flooded in the winter so they could play hockey. They formed a symphony orchestra and a theater troupe which put on Shakespeare productions. Camp 30 had also been built on fertile farmland and the prisoners took advantage of it. They brought in enormous harvests. Canadians in the surrounding areas, living under war rations, claimed the Germans were eating better than they were. And there was certainly a vast gulf between the treatment of these enemy soldiers and the thousands of Japanese Canadians rounded up into hellish internment camps. The POWs even continued to receive pay from Germany, not to mention Christmas bonuses from Hermann Göring, commander of the Luftwaffe, allowing them to buy from an expansive commissary. Even more incredible, they were allowed to spend their money on day trips. Ehrenwort is a German word for a culturally deep-seated sense of honesty and honor. The Germans took it very seriously, and the Canadians knew it, so they trusted the Germans to go shopping in nearby towns, swimming in Lake Ontario, or cross-country skiing knowing they'd honestly and honorably come back to Camp 30 for a round of tennis and an evening swim before bed. In fact, the POWs had to be disciplined by their officers because their letters home were so glowing it bordered on treason. The guards, mostly Canadian veterans of the First World War, spoke fondly of the time they spent here. So deep was their sense of trust with their wards, they'd lend the prisoners rifles to go hunting it was like a strange fairy tale they were all living. And then, thanks to a Canadian brigadier half a world away, it all came crashing down. August 19, 1942, 0500 hours. 6,000 Allied infantrymen, mostly Canadians, pour onto the beach at the French town of Dieppe to take it back from the Nazis. One of them has made a fateful mistake. He's kept a copy of his operational orders with him. The assault is a disaster, one of the most notorious days in Canadian military history. 
60% of the Allied force is killed, wounded, or captured, and among them, our brigadier with his operational orders. The document is seized and makes its way up the German ranks, all the way up. Buried deep within the document is a reference to the binding of Axis prisoners. And after the Battle of Dieppe and a British raid, the Nazis allegedly find German prisoners who had been bound and then shot. Hitler sees a propaganda opportunity. He falsely connects the dots. The Allies, he says, are butchers on orders to tie up German soldiers and execute them. Soon, he issues the infamous Commando Order, declaring Allied Special Forces exempt from the Geneva Convention. They'll be shot on sight, even if they surrender. But first, Berlin announces that more than a thousand prisoners from the Battle of Dieppe will be shackled, most of them Canadian. It's up to Canada to respond, and they decide to retaliate in kind. Back at Camp 30, the Germans' relative paradise is about to be shattered. A Canadian guard approaches the ranking German officer and asks that he volunteer a hundred of his men to be shackled. The officer refuses, so to his subordinates. Negotiations break down quickly. None of the POWs show up for the next roll call. When the order comes to shackle the prisoners by force, the Germans barricade themselves in the camp's buildings. The battle of Bowmanville is about to begin. The largest concentration of prisoners is here in the mess hall, and the guards believe that if they can break through, the rest of the buildings will follow. All day, they're at a standoff. The Canadians arm themselves with baseball bats. The Germans with anything they can get their hands on. Hockey sticks, beer bottles, jam jars. The Germans are itching for a good fight. They're treating the whole situation like a sporting match. But the aging members of the Canadian Veterans Guard have heard that 50 trainees are on their way from a nearby military camp, so they are content to wait. That evening, the young soldiers arrive, and the siege begins. Over the next several hours of brawling, there are bruises and bloody noses. But the worst injury suffered is on the Canadian side, a fractured skull from a thrown jar of jam. Finally, the prisoners in the mess hall are subdued, and over the next two days, the other buildings follow, the siege aided by high-powered water hoses. At last, the POWs agree to lay down arms. In the aftermath, 126 prisoners are relocated to other camps. Those who remain must be shackled. But in a strange coincidence, the guards accidentally drop the keys to the shackles every day, right after roll call. And then the war was over. 35,000 prisoners across Canada began the long process of returning to their homeland. Germany was a blasted out shell, a crumbling ruin of its former glory, drenched in the blood of fascism and with an uncertain future. For many returning prisoners, it was unrecognizable. And because of the kindness and trust they've been shown here, the place that came closest to embodying that sense of home was now Canada. More than 6,000 prisoners asked to stay here permanently as soon as the war was over, and even more would immigrate back later, citing the hospitality they'd been shown as prisoners. As the wife of one such man put it, his greatest piece of luck was being sent to Canada as a prisoner of war. Canadians probably shouldn't be too quick to pat ourselves on the back as great humanitarians of the Second World War. I'll talk a bit more about that in a second. 
But first, I want to thank you so much for watching. If you'd like to see more incredible stories about the history of Canada, you can subscribe by clicking that button below. You can also follow us on social media, on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. We're at This Is Canadiana. We have many more stories to tell from all across this country, but to do it, we'll need your help. You can become a regular supporter on Patreon, or you can just give us a one-time donation on PayPal. Every little bit helps. Now, as I mentioned in the episode itself, while we were making our German guests very comfortable, Canadians of Japanese descent weren't being treated anywhere near as kindly. Japanese Canadians had been facing racism for years all across the country, especially on the West Coast. And when the war began and Japan entered it, Japanese Canadians were rounded up, tens of thousands of them, and sent off to internment camps. There were no tennis courts or swimming pools, just exposure, malnutrition, and broken families. It's something we're definitely planning on addressing in a future episode of Canadiana. But for now, thanks so much for watching. I'm Adam Bunch, and we'll see you next time on Canadiana.